The thing to really keep an eye on actually is China because China is just moving really relentlessly forward in all of their plans with both in terms of human spaceflight, in terms of their robotic spaceflight, in terms of developing new crew capsules, lunar landers, and a new heavy lift rocket. Their plan is to land humans on the moon before 2030, 2029. And I think they're going to do it. Like Very likely. Very, yeah. I mean, they've got all the pieces in place. They've, they've redesigned the human, their crew capsule. They've got a lunar lander design. They've got a new heavy lift rocket that's in development. And their plan is really simple. They're going to have two of these heavy lift rockets. One's going to carry the lunar lander. One's going to carry the crew capsule. They're going to meet up at the moon. The crew is going to go from the crew capsule into the lunar lander, go down to the lunar surface, and use the exact same technology from their recent sample return mission. Like, like you can see all the pieces coming to place, right? They tested this technology. There's another lunar sample return mission coming in next year to further make sure that this is right. And then there's like another one that's going to be a couple of years later. So you're going to have two more cracks at at doing sample return as well as a sample return mission from an asteroid. So they're really starting to dial in getting payloads off the surface of the moon and back into space, and then bringing them back to Earth, they've demonstrated their ability to send humans to and from the Chinese space station. And so that that idea of having two identical rockets with two roughly identical payloads that meet at the moon is really simple compared to what is going to happen with Artemis 3. And so I would not be surprised if they they just meet their schedule and blow right through it, right? Very pragmatic is my assessment of that. Is yeah, that they, yeah. They, they, they don't get caught up in all of the the politics and bureaucracy that creates mission profiles in NASA (laughs) and and ESA for that matter, but they they just go and do it. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, there's, you know, like for all the downsides that you get from this, from this, from all of the other aspects, boy, you can get a well run or at least a, you know, uh, space exploration plan that follows a long-term objective because, you know, People don't have a lot of choice. You you end up with the same party every year and they just follow the plan. So, yeah. Now, has China released any information on where on the moon they're choosing to land? Uh, Yes. I mean, they're planning to, they're aiming for the South Pole as well. I see. But I wonder, there was, I see this is just outside of my brain, but there was a, we did cover this on Universe Today. There was a, so they put out a paper in, so China put out a paper in 2022 where they were proposing sites for a lunar research station. And that would be obviously the same place that they would send humans. So it's going to be at the South Pole close to the Atkin Basin. So essentially the, the, the lunar missions that are being planned are look for the ice <laughs> at the poles and see what what can be done there and that's that's the area of interest and it's not so much the uh you know going to the lunar maria or anything like that my question is is that that more dangerous in other words going into terrain that's not completely flat like that it seems to up the danger level doesn't it i i don't know i mean there are i mean at the end of the day the moon is cold and then it's hot uh, you don't have a lot of atmosphere. Like the conditions are roughly the same, but as you said, there are mountains and and craters and stuff. The lunar landing sites that were chosen for the Apollo missions were like really right there in the middle of the moon that they were easily seen from Earth. You could transmit to and to and fro from the moon. The challenge of landing at the South Pole of the Moon is about being able to communicate because in some cases you're not going to have a direct view of Earth. And so you're gonna have to use some kind of relay transmission to be able to do that. And again, the Chinese have demonstrated this, they landed a rover at the South Pole, they used a relay satellite on the far side of the moon to communicate back to Earth. And they were able to to demonstrate that this is feasible. And so that is one of the big challenges. And, and NASA is considering how they're going to be 
solving the same problem as well. So anyone who's going to the South Pole of the Moon has got to think about how they're going to get their data home, how they're going to maintain contact with the astronauts. Now, another area of interest with what China's doing in science is FAST, which is now uh, the world's largest radio telescope, and nothing really compares to it ever since uh, Arecibo collapsed. So what is on the agenda for radio astronomy with FAST? Well, FAST, as you said, is, is a gigantic telescope, 500-meter telescope. It was bigger than Arecibo. It didn't have the same radar capability of, of Arecibo. And so like Arecibo really was a, a unique instrument. FAST is bigger, but it couldn't do the same things that FAST, that, that Arecibo could do. But, but, you know, we're seeing a lot of research coming out of China for their, uh, their work on pulsars, on doing a lot of radio astronomy observations. And one of the really interesting things, actually, there's just a paper that just came out today that I was looking at. They're putting a big investment into SETI. So while in the West, interest in SETI is finally there, like NASA is finally funding SETI papers, doing, you know, searches and things like that. The, the poor people at SETI have needed to use borrowed data, having to set up pipelines so that they can slurp up some of the data that while someone's like examining pulsars. But again, in China, they are taking this very seriously. There is both local funding for SETI searches as well as international collaborations using FAST. And they have been studying exo known exoplanets. They've been studying uh, globular clusters where you could theoretically have like a bunch of civilizations inside a cluster because there could be a million stars in there. And so you could sort of scoop up the whole cluster in one go and they've been looking for signals from from extraterrestrial intelligences so that's one of the big things that is quite exciting is there's a lot of really interesting SETI work that's coming out of China as well I wonder if, I, if it's like inspired by the three-body problem like because that book has been so successful that, that there's a lot of support in China to sort of I don't know live up to the expectations of the book that might be what's going on because, you know, sometimes literary yeah. and cultural things can actually affect policy. <laughs> yeah, you think about like the effect of Star Trek, right? Just on on the kinds of technologies that get developed in the West. Uh, it's interesting. It is. And I wish China, you know, good luck because it's all collective science. And I'm sure that the, on the agenda, the using fast, you know, lots of uh, Western scientists will get to use it as well. Yeah, there's a lot. I mean, like... There is a lot of collaborations coming out of the FAST telescope. Like when you see papers based on FAST, in some cases, nobody from China worked on it, that it was all a Western collaboration. Or in some cases, it's a it's a team of Chinese astronomers and Western astronomers, and other times it's all Chinese astronomers. So, so they have made FAST very available to researchers. You know, they've, they've got a bunch of other telescopes and instruments that they've they've set up. They've got a new powerful solar observatory. They're developing their version of the Hubble Space Telescope, which is going to be flying in formation with the Chinese space station. And they're doing a lot of work in gravitational wave astronomy. So they have plans for a space-based gravitational wave detector as well as ground-based gravitational wave detectors. And they are in the process of building the largest steerable radio telescope in the world. So there's a lot of research in this coming out of China. The gravitational wave thing is interesting because there is a phenomenon known as uh, glitching in gravitational wave detectors. And there's a recent paper on it that they don't really know if it's even real or if it's some sort of instrument abnormality. Well, if you've got two gravitational wave detectors on different parts of the planet, then you might be able to pick up the same thing at both, you know, detectors and figure out if this is actually astrophysical or if it's just some sort of instrument glitching in LIGO. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, LIGO already is two separate observatories that are designed to do exactly this, that if one detects um, something happening and the other one doesn't, then it gets thrown out. You need confirmation on both observatories to detect it. But I, I hadn't read this paper. Now, I saved the best for last because it is the the instrument that's coming online that excites me the most because it's just going to be an absolute data dump. 
and that is Vera Rubin. Yeah. And that sees first light this coming year, I think, in late yep. 2024. Yeah. What's the progress there? Yeah, that's it. That's the progress. I mean, the progress is that we should see first light from the Vera Rubin telescope. So Vera Rubin is this 8.2 meter, like the big telescope class in Chile with the largest camera that's ever been built. It's like three gigabyte camera. And it will take an image of the night sky every 15 seconds and then move on to the next spot beside it, take an image of the sky. And because it's this big telescope and it's built with adaptive optics, it's going to take really deep, really faint images of the sky. And then all of this data is going to be dumped out onto the internet. And its job is to find all of the things that the universe does when we weren't looking. So it's going to be looking for supernova detonations, it's going to be looking for asteroids moving through the field of view, new comets, planet nine, all of these things, and, and entirely new phenomena that we had no idea were going on out there in space. It's only by looking at the entire sky continuously, every three days, it will update its images of the of the night sky, that these things will, will be found. And I'll give you some some examples like type 1a supernova, which are one of the most useful things that astronomers use to measure distance in the universe It's how we discovered the presence of dark energy. It was found using, you know, studying these type 1a supernova. And over the 25 years that astronomers have been doing this analysis, they found about 1500 of these type 1a supernova. Vera Rubin in its 10 years of operation should find a million of them. <laughs> right? And, and, and other variable stars and other supernova and like, who knows what it's going to find. There's like this class of asteroids that NASA has identified the ones that are 140 meters and bigger, you know, they found most of the kilometer sized ones, but it's the ones that are down to 140 meters that are still dangerous at a, you know, local level, the, you know, the city killers. And Vera Rubin will find them all like 90% of them. And so again, you've just got this incredibly powerful tool that's coming online. And I love like, they've changed the way they're going to be releasing this data. So with Vera Rubin, everything is just going to be public domain immediately. And they're going to have this, it has this pipeline where it identifies important events in pretty much real time and then alerts the astronomers. And so there will be this one feed that is highlights that Vera Rubin has found on its own. It'll be like, oh, I found a supernova. Oh, and I found this variable star over here. Oh, and I found this asteroid. And there's planet nine. And then there will be this other data that all of the data will be getting dumped out. And then you'll be able to use the tools on Vera Rubin to do targeted searches and say things like, well, I wonder, you know, I'm looking for this kind of a thing. And you'll be able to dig through the archive to find what you're looking for. And so it's like, in the olden days, you would get time on a telescope to analyze some target. And then you would get your telescope time with James Webb or whatever, and then you would analyze that target. But now we're shifting to this world where instead of getting time on a telescope, you just dig through the archive, because everything was looked at simultaneously. And there's this continuous observation of the night sky, which is just wonderful. So yeah, th I, there is no telescope that I am more excited about than Vera Rubin. I just wish we had a second one, an identical one in the north. Yeah, in the north. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah, there is no time domain astronomy telescope planned for the Northern Hemisphere yet. Yet. Maybe China will do it. Yet. I, well, yeah, I wouldn't be. I, I feel like China is planning one, but I don't know where they would put it. It's it's hard to, like it's hard to keep up with everything that China is doing. And I, yeah, it really is. And they're not always forthcoming. You and know. they're not forthcoming. No, they are terrible at telling us what they're doing. Yep. Probably, you know, you know, secretive. Secretive, so. but also the fact that they may be telling everybody internally um, in Chinese newspapers, but it yes. doesn't translate over somehow and things are missed. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I do, I do follow stuff back into Chinese sources as best I can, uh, but it's a, it's a whole other sort of internet. And the way news moves around on the Chinese internet through Weibo and, and uh, you know, their various WeChat, it's a, it's a different creature. So it's really hard to find news in the same way. 
without just being immersed in it all the time. All right, Fraser, we're out of time. It's always a pleasure talking to you, and I'm really excited about the year to come, and I'm really happy with how 2023 turned out. 100%. This is going to be a great year.